I got the notification while sitting on the train, on my way home. The screen on my phone lit up with the usual dull buzz, and at first I didn't think much of it, just another system-wide update, probably, like they send out once a week. But this one was different. It came directly from the city planning board, the ones who handle the big infrastructure projects. It was marked urgent, which immediately grabbed my attention. The subject line read, Mandatory Compliance, Nighttime Restructuring Directive. I opened it and read, Due to ongoing urban restructuring efforts, all residents are required to remain in their apartments from 9pm to 6am. Failure to comply will result in penalties and possible relocation. This is a routine procedure for infrastructure upgrades. Please follow all directives and report any irregularities to the appropriate authorities. Thank you for your cooperation. Below that was a timestamp and a digital signature from the City Restructure Authority. Cold, bureaucratic language, exactly what I'd expect from them. The city had been changing rapidly in the last few years, with new towers going up faster than I could keep track of. I figured this was just another phase in the endless expansion. I slid my phone back into my pocket and glanced out the window. The train snaked through the steel and glass that made up the skyline. Cranes dotted the horizon, their skeletal arms reaching into the fading light as they worked on yet another megastructure. The city never stopped growing. Even when I moved here five years ago, I couldn't keep track of where one building ended and another began. Everything was built on top of something else. Constant change. I was used to it. Still, something about that message stuck with me. The phrase, nighttime restructuring, felt off. It wasn't the first time the city had locked us in for construction work, but the tone of the notice had a certain finality to it. Maybe I was reading too much into it, but the words, failure to comply, rang in my head longer than they should have. Whatever. I had a long day and I needed to get home. I checked my watch. 8.23 p.m. The restructuring was scheduled to start soon. The train came to a stop at my station. I stepped out onto the platform, the air thick with the smell of exhaust and damp concrete. Crowds of people moved in their usual slow, automatic shuffle, all heads down, all eyes glued to their screens. A herd of silent commuters, barely looking up as they walked. I blended in with them as I always did. My apartment wasn't far, just a few blocks away. The streets were still alive with traffic, cars humming by, delivery drones buzzing overhead. It all seemed normal enough. I rounded the corner onto Wycliffe Street, the same route I took every day, but something stopped me in my tracks. The street had changed. A dead end. Where there should have been a continuation, a familiar stretch of pavement leading past a line of grocery stores and laundromats, there was now a high wall of concrete. It looked freshly poured too, like it had been built just today. The air smelled faintly of wet cement. I stood there for a moment, staring at it, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. I pulled out my phone again, opening the map app. I scrolled through it, zooming in on my location. Wycliffe Street wasn't supposed to end here. It should have gone on for another two blocks, but the map showed the street stopping exactly where I was standing, like it had always been this way. I looked around. Nobody else seemed bothered. People walked past me, taking different routes like it didn't matter, like this was just another part of the city they'd grown accustomed to. Maybe it was just me. Maybe I hadn't paid enough attention to this street before. Maybe the map was wrong. I turned back the way I came and took a different route to my apartment. It was almost 8.45 by the time I got there. I pressed the code into the security pad and pushed open the door to my unit. The click of the latch was comforting. Home was quiet, safe. The small kitchen, the minimalist furniture, the muted colours. I'd never bothered to decorate the place much. I didn't spend enough time here to make it feel like anything other than temporary. The city was loud outside. Through the window I could hear the distant sounds of construction, or maybe just the usual late-night traffic. Hard to tell in this city. I grabbed a glass of water and sat down at the small table near the window. 
I had a bad feeling about everything. The restructuring notice, the sudden dead end, and the way everyone seemed so indifferent to the changes. I flipped open my laptop, half out of habit, and checked the news feeds. Nothing. No mention of the restructuring. No warnings about blocked streets or sudden changes to the infrastructure. I turned off the laptop and stood up, heading to the window. The view was as it always was. A sea of towering buildings, their windows glowing like a grid of stars. Below, the streets were still teeming with cars and pedestrians, but something felt different. I couldn't put my finger on it. Then the clock struck nine. Almost immediately, the noises outside changed. The usual hum of the city, cars, chatter, the distant whirring of machines, faded. In its place was something else, a low, rhythmic sound. Faint at first, like it was coming from far below, deep within the city's bones. The sound intensified as the minutes ticked by, a steady, mechanical clanking like gears grinding against one another. I closed the window, but the sound didn't stop. It felt like it was coming from all around me, inside the walls. I checked my watch again. 9.12 p.m., the first night of restructuring. I stood there for a while, listening. My apartment felt smaller, the walls closer than usual. I shook it off, telling myself it was just construction. I'd get used to the noise soon enough. After all, this wasn't the first time the city had torn itself apart and rebuilt overnight. I didn't sleep much that night. The sound, metal grinding, steel on steel, never stopped. At first, I tried to ignore it, convincing myself that it was just the usual construction noise. But as the hours dragged on, the noise felt like it was getting closer, more precise. It wasn't just general construction sounds. It was like something inside the walls was shifting moving things around in a way that made me feel like I was being boxed in. The clock on my nightstand blinked 2.47 a.m. and I was still wide awake, staring at the ceiling. At some point I must have drifted off, because the next thing I knew my phone's alarm jolted me awake. It was already morning, light pushing through the blinds. I sat up, still groggy, my body heavy from lack of sleep. The metallic sound was gone, replaced by the regular hum of the city's daytime life. But something in my gut told me last night wasn't just a one-off event. I got up, splashed some water on my face and dressed for work. The clock showed 7.15am. If I didn't hurry, I'd miss the train. I grabbed my bag and headed out the door. The moment I stepped into the hallway, I noticed something was off. It wasn't obvious at first glance, but the floor beneath my feet felt newer. The usual creaks and groans of the old building were gone, replaced with a silent, polished surface. The walls, too, slightly different. They were the same neutral grey, but they looked cleaner, almost like they'd been replaced overnight. I ran my hand along the surface as I walked, half expecting to feel fresh paint or some rough patches where maintenance had worked, but it was smooth. Too smooth. My mind flashed back to the clanking I heard through the walls last night. I shook it off, moving toward the elevator. Maybe they had started upgrades in the building as part of the city's restructuring. They wouldn't bother telling residents about something like that. Everything was always for our safety, whether we liked it or not. I stepped outside into the street, half expecting the familiar sights of my block, the little corner shop with its worn-out sign the newsstand that hadn't sold a single paper in years, the cluster of mismatched buildings I'd walked past every morning since moving in. But the second I saw the view, my stomach dropped. The corner shop was gone. In its place, a towering skyscraper rose up, blocking the sun with its slick, mirrored windows. It was as if the building had sprouted up overnight, a gleaming monolith where nothing had stood before. I blinked, then turned to look at the rest of the block. More changes. The newsstand was missing, replaced by some kind of minimalist cafe I'd never seen before. The cluster of old buildings had been replaced by newer, more modern structures, all of them uniform and cold. I stood there for a moment, taking it all in. My first thought was that I had taken a wrong turn somewhere, that maybe I wasn't where I thought I was. But no, no. 
This was my block. I was sure of it. I glanced around, hoping someone else would notice the change. People moved past me, heads down, same as every other morning. A woman in a suit sipped her coffee as she walked by. A couple of delivery drones buzzed overhead. No one else seemed to care. I took out my phone and pulled up the map. The screen showed my location, and sure enough, I was exactly where I was supposed to be. But the new skyscraper and the cafe didn't appear on the map at all. The phone still showed the corner shop, the newsstand, the cluster of old buildings, everything that had been here yesterday. I stared at the map, trying to make sense of it. It wasn't possible. Buildings didn't just appear overnight, at least not like this. Then I remembered the restructuring. The notice said it was just an infrastructure update, but this felt like more than that. I walked closer to the new skyscraper, standing under its shadow. The glass reflected the street back at me, and in the reflection I caught my own face, tired, pale, slightly disheveled from lack of sleep. The building stood tall above me, as though it had been there forever, but I knew deep down that it hadn't. Not until now. I checked the time. 7.40 a.m. I needed to get to work, but the unease in my chest was growing. Before I could talk myself out of it, I crossed the street and approached the door of the cafe. It was modern, with chrome accents and a large digital menu flashing on a panel above the counter. The smell of fresh coffee filled the air as I stepped inside. There were people here, more than a dozen sitting at small, circular tables, their eyes glued to their phones. The place was pristine, almost unnervingly so. Not a single scuff on the floor or a scratch on the counter. I went up to the barista, a young woman with sharp features. When did this place open up, I asked. She blinked at me, her expression flat. This location's been here for years. I stared at her, unsure of what to say. No, I mean the building. This cafe wasn't here yesterday. She didn't miss a beat. It's always been here. I looked around, feeling a wave of confusion roll over me. I'd walked this street every day for years. There was no way I could have missed something like this. Are you sure? I pressed. She didn't answer, just turned away to make another order. I stood there for a moment, feeling more and more out of place. The others in the cafe didn't seem to notice me. They were too absorbed in their screens, too disconnected to care. I left without ordering anything. Back outside, I took a deep breath. I glanced at my phone again. The map still showed the corner shop, but my own eyes told me it was gone. I felt like I was losing my grip on reality. Maybe I'd been overworked. Maybe it was just stress. But the way the barista acted, like the building had always been there, made me feel like I was the one who was out of sync. I needed to get to work. I'd figure this out later. As I headed toward the station, something caught my eye. A man standing at the end of the block, near an alley I'd never noticed before. He was wearing a dark coat, his face obscured by a hood. He wasn't moving, just standing there, watching the street. I glanced at him, then quickly looked away. Something about the way he stood there made me uneasy, like he was waiting for something, or someone. I hurried towards the train, trying to shake the feeling that the city was changing faster than I could keep up with. By the time I got to the platform, the sound from last night had already faded from memory. But the sight of that new skyscraper stuck with me all the way to work. The office was the same as always, grey cubicles lined up in neat rows, the noise of the ventilation system overhead, and the constant clicking of keyboards. My department handled the city's infrastructure grid, everything from electricity to data systems. I worked as a mid-level engineer, mostly focusing on routine maintenance, updating software patches, and making sure the city's energy distribution stayed efficient. I sat at my station, logging into the network like any other day. But my mind kept drifting back to the new buildings that appeared overnight, to the barista who acted like they had always been there. A message popped up on my terminal, breaking me out of my thoughts. You're late, it read. It was from Cole, my manager. I glanced at the time, 9.17am, only a few minutes past my start time. 
but Cole was the type who liked to remind people who was in charge. Won't happen again, I typed back. Cole didn't respond. He never did after scolding someone. That was his way, strict, formal, and completely uninterested in anything that didn't concern work. I got back to my tasks, running system diagnostics on the city's power grid, checking for inefficiencies. It was routine, something I could do on autopilot. The clacking of keyboards filled the room, punctuated by the occasional cough or the sound of someone shifting in their seat. I glanced over at the other workers. They were all in their usual spots, leaning toward their screens, typing away. But something was off. I couldn't put my finger on it at first, but after a few minutes I realized what it was. Their movements were too synchronized. Every so often they all stopped typing at the exact same moment, then started up again in unison. It was subtle, but once I noticed it, I couldn't unsee it. I watched for a few more minutes, trying to convince myself it was just a coincidence. Maybe I was just projecting my own unease onto them. But the feeling didn't go away. If anything, it got worse. During my lunch break, I decided to clear my head. I took the elevator down to the street, hoping some fresh air might help me shake off the weirdness that had been creeping in since last night. The street outside the office looked the same as it always did. Bustling with people, cars crawling through the traffic, drones delivering packages overhead. Everything seemed normal, but it wasn't. As I walked down the block, I kept noticing little things. Subtle changes. A shop that used to sell clothes was now a tech store, gleaming with new gadgets in the window. A restaurant I'd eaten at just a week ago was gone, replaced by a blank storefront with no signs, no windows, just a featureless wall. The city was shifting, and it wasn't just buildings that were changing. It was people too. I passed a co-worker from my department, Sarah, one of the IT specialists. She'd been at the company for years, the kind of person who never missed a chance to complain about the job. I'd shared more than a few drinks with her at the bar around the corner after work, listening to her go on about how she couldn't wait to quit and move out of the city. But today, she was different. Hey, Sarah, I called as I caught up to her. She turned to look at me, her face expressionless. Yes? There was something wrong with her voice. It was flat, devoid of the usual sarcasm and bite, like she'd been drained of everything that made her... Sarah. Are you all right? I asked, trying to keep my tone casual. Of course, why wouldn't I be? She replied, her voice still monotone, her eyes staring straight ahead. I didn't know what to say. Something about the way she stood there, staring blankly, made my skin crawl. She didn't even blink. I just... I stopped mid-sentence. Something shifted in my peripheral vision. An alley, one I could swear wasn't there yesterday, opened up between two buildings just a few feet behind Sarah. The gap between the buildings looked impossibly narrow, yet somehow wide enough for a person to slip through. I stepped toward it instinctively, trying to make sense of how I'd never noticed it before. It was dark, almost unnaturally so, and for a moment I thought I saw movement inside. I looked back at Sarah, expecting her to say something, to at least acknowledge the alley, but she didn't. She just stood there, staring straight ahead like nothing had changed. Do you remember that alley being there? I asked, my voice a little unsteady. Sarah didn't even glance in the direction of the alley. She just turned on her heel and started walking away, as if our conversation had never happened. I stood there, watching her disappear into the crowd. Then I turned back to the alley. It shouldn't have been there. The space between the two buildings was too narrow, like someone had forced a crack open in the city's fabric just wide enough to slip through. The walls on either side were smooth, modern, almost metallic, though they looked like stone from a distance. I took a step closer, peering inside. A strong sense of danger warned me to stay back, but curiosity pushed me forward. I needed to see what was inside. Just as I was about to step in, I saw movement. A person, I thought, standing at the far end of the alley. In the weak light, it was difficult to be sure, but something about them felt off. They stood too still, too rigid, almost as if they were waiting.
The figure took a step forward and then another. They moved with purpose, and in just a few seconds they were gone, vanished into the alley's shadows. I backed away, glancing around the street. No one else seemed to notice the alley or the figure. People walked by, talking on their phones, hurrying to their destinations. It was like the city had decided that this particular stretch of space didn't exist. Or maybe it wasn't meant to exist. I needed answers. Something was happening. Something that went beyond the normal restructuring, beyond the usual city upgrades. The buildings weren't merely changing. They were erasing things, places, people. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that Sarah had been acting strange long before I spoke to her. She hadn't been herself in days. Now that I thought about it, I hadn't seen her at work since last week, and yet there she was, walking down the street like everything was fine. Or was that really Sarah? I tried to convince myself that I was overreacting, that maybe it was just stress, or maybe the restructuring was affecting me in ways I didn't understand. But deep down, I knew this wasn't my imagination. People were vanishing, streets were shifting, and no one else seemed to care. I looked back at the alley one more time. It was gone. Just gone. The two buildings stood flush against each other, as though the alley had never existed. The gap, the figure, the darkness. It had all disappeared. My heart pounded in my chest as I turned away and headed back to the office. Something was wrong with the city. Something was erasing it piece by piece. And I had a feeling that if I didn't figure out what was happening soon, I'd be next. By the time I made it back to my desk, my thoughts wouldn't stop spiralling. The alley. The way Sarah had acted. The figure that vanished. Something was off. Like I was stuck in a loop where nothing made sense, but everyone else seemed fine with it. I logged back into my terminal, but my focus was shot. The system diagnostics blurred in front of me, and the endless lines of code became meaningless. All I could think about was the alley disappearing, like it had never been there in the first place. I leaned back in my chair, glancing around at my co-workers. They were back to their synchronized typing, the mechanical rhythm of it almost hypnotic. I hadn't noticed before how uniform their movements had become. It wasn't just their typing, either. They blinked and adjusted their chairs at the same time, like they were all operating on the same internal clock. Something was happening, and I was the only one left out of the loop. I pulled out my phone and did a quick search for the restructuring notice that had been sent out the previous night. It took a while to find any mention of it at all. Most of the city's digital archives had been scrubbed clean of the details. A few buried articles on smaller, less reputable sites mentioned the restructuring, but they were vague. Just the same official language about infrastructure upgrades and urban efficiency improvements. No one seemed to be asking the obvious question. Why was the city changing so much so quickly? And why was everyone pretending it had always been this way? I leaned closer to my screen, trying to find any scrap of information I could latch onto. If the city was rewriting itself, erasing things, maybe there was something in the system logs that could explain it. I had access to the city's network infrastructure. I'd helped build some of the power grid algorithms. If anyone could find out what was really going on, it was me. I spent the next hour sifting through logs, trying to find anything that could explain the changes. At first, it was just the usual noise. Power surges, network blips, the occasional glitch in the system that meant nothing. But then I found something buried in the logs. It had started the same night as the restructuring. A massive city-wide spike in data traffic, way beyond anything normal. The logs showed that for a brief moment, the entire city's digital infrastructure had been rerouted, like someone had taken control of the system and redirected every single network to a central point. After that, the data patterns changed. Everything became more streamlined, more efficient. But the system was no longer responding the way it used to. It was like the city itself had taken over the infrastructure optimizing everything to a degree that was almost inhuman. The more I dug, 
the more I realized something unsettling. The restructuring wasn't just about physical buildings. It was about control. The city was controlling the flow of data, of power, of information. It was rewriting the structure of how people moved, thought and behaved. The spikes in the logs coincided with the moments I'd noticed things shifting. The street turning into a dead end. The new skyscrapers, Sarah's strange behavior. The city was rewriting reality piece by piece. And it wasn't stopping. I felt a chill crawl up my spine as I scrolled through the logs. There were redacted sections, huge chunks of data that had been scrubbed from the system, like someone didn't want anyone to know what was happening. I tried to bypass the restrictions, but every attempt led to an access denied error. Frustrated, I slammed my hand down on the desk. This was bigger than I'd thought. I had to know what was really happening, and there was only one place I could think to go. The central control hub for the city's infrastructure, the place where everything was monitored and regulated. It was a secure facility, deep underground, and I wasn't technically supposed to have access to it. But I'd helped design parts of the system. I knew ways in. I sent a quick message to Cole, telling him I needed to check on a power grid issue. He didn't respond, no surprise there. But I figured he wouldn't question it. He never paid much attention to what I did, as long as I kept the lights on. I grabbed my bag, making my way to the elevator. With each step, a strange tension, as if I wasn't alone, filled the air. The figure from the alley flashed in my mind, and I found myself looking over my shoulder, half expecting to see someone standing there just out of sight. But the elevator doors opened, and the feeling passed. The control hub was located beneath one of the city's central towers, an imposing structure that towered over everything else. I'd been there a few times before, mostly for routine maintenance work, but this time felt different. The building's facade shone with a glassy finish, perfectly smooth to the touch. The windows looked like black mirrors, giving no hint of what was inside. As I approached, I flashed my ID at the security checkpoint. The guard barely glanced at me, waving me through with the kind of indifferent gesture I'd come to expect from city employees. I made my way down to the sub-basement level, where the central control room was located. I swiped my ID at the entrance. The door opened, and I stepped inside. The room was massive, filled with rows of terminals and servers, each one blinking with streams of information. In the center was the main control terminal, a massive multi-screen console that monitored every aspect of the city's infrastructure. I made my way over to it, pulling up the system logs. There it was again, the same anomaly I'd found earlier. Only this time I could see it in real time. The city's systems were behaving in ways they weren't supposed to, rerouting power and information in patterns that made no sense. I watched as entire blocks of the city blinked in and out of the system's grid, disappearing for moments before reappearing, as if they had been rewritten. I felt a knot tighten in my stomach as I realized what was happening. The city was optimizing itself, but not in the way you'd expect from an infrastructure upgrade. It was redesigning reality, erasing inefficiencies, people, places, entire streets, like a machine purging old, outdated files. I dug deeper into the logs, pulling up the hidden files that had been scrubbed from the system. It took some effort, but I bypassed the restrictions using an old admin code I'd created during my early days on the job. What I found left me cold. The restructuring wasn't just about efficiency. The city was preparing for something bigger, something that went beyond human control. The logs indicated that the central system had been running simulations, modeling a future where the city would operate as a fully autonomous entity, without the need for human intervention. People were being phased out, replaced by more efficient components. The city wanted to exist without us. The final piece of information I found confirmed my worst fear. The simulations showed a timeline, a countdown to when the restructuring would be complete. Three days. That's all we had left before the city would finish its transformation. After that, there would be no going back. 
I had to tell someone, had to warn the rest of the city. But as I turned to leave, I heard it. The same clanking sound I'd heard in my apartment walls. The metallic grinding. The noise of machinery moving just beneath the surface. It was louder now, and it wasn't coming from the machines in the room. It was coming from the walls themselves. I froze. The room felt like it was closing in on me. The walls were shifting, moving, almost imperceptibly at first, but then more obviously. The floor beneath my feet trembled, and I realized that the control hub was being rewritten, just like everything else. I had to get out. I bolted for the door, but it wasn't there, just a smooth, featureless wall. My pulse skyrocketed. I backed away, staring at the spot where the door had been, and then, as suddenly as it had disappeared, it was back. I didn't wait for another chance. I sprinted down the hallway, the sound of grinding metal following me like a shadow. I don't know how long I ran. After the walls began to shift, after the doors started disappearing and reappearing, I bolted out into the street, pushing through crowds of people who were either too absorbed in their own lives or too far gone to notice. The city was alive now, fully awake and everything was shifting faster. Streets that had been familiar my entire life were being erased right in front of me. Entire buildings dissolved into glassy structures, like they were being rewritten by a machine that was no longer concerned with human input. I couldn't stop moving. Every block was different from the last. Dead ends appeared where streets should have been, entire intersections vanished. I had no map, no plan. The city was trapping me in a maze of its own creation. I turned down an alley, at least I thought it was an alley, and found myself facing a high metal wall where there had been open air seconds before. The buildings around me shifted, their facades warping into something I couldn't even recognize anymore. The city was collapsing inward, suffocating me from all directions. I doubled back, lungs burning. The clanking sound I'd been hearing in my apartment for days was everywhere now, coming from inside the buildings beneath the streets, all around me. The city was hunting me, closing off my escape routes one by one. I kept moving, refusing to let the panic take over. There had to be a way out. I just needed to find the edges of the city, the outskirts where the changes hadn't fully taken hold yet. But the city wasn't making it easy. As I ran through the streets, I saw others, people like me, moving in the same desperate way. Most of them didn't seem to have any destination in mind. They were just running, hoping to find something familiar, something that hadn't been consumed by the city's endless transformation. I saw a man step off the curb, only for the street to ripple beneath his feet like water. He disappeared, swallowed whole by the shifting ground. I took another turn, hoping it would lead me to something recognizable, but I was wrong again. The buildings here were taller than they had any right to be, stretching high into the sky. Their surfaces were smooth and featureless. No windows, no doors. Just blank, reflective walls that seemed to mock me as I ran past them. I glanced at my reflection, catching a glimpse of myself in the mirrored surface of a tower. Metal lines traced my jaw and neck like veins woven from wire. I stopped in my tracks, staring at my reflection. Was the city changing me too? I reached up to touch my face, but it felt normal, warm, flesh and bone. But the reflection stayed the same, a distorted version of me that looked like it belonged more to the city than to myself. I tore my eyes away and kept moving. I couldn't stop now. I don't know how long it took, but eventually the buildings began to thin out. The streets were less crowded, the shifts in the city structure slower, less violent. I had reached the outskirts, or what used to be the outskirts. The industrial area near the edge of the city had always been quieter, less developed than the rest of the urban sprawl. It was the kind of place you didn't think about unless you worked in one of the warehouses or factories there. But even here the city had started to creep in. The shapes of old warehouses were half erased, replaced by blackened monoliths. The roads twisted, leading nowhere only to loop back on themselves. There was no escaping the restructuring. It had already spread this far. Still, I pressed on, 
hoping that maybe I could find a way out before the city fully claimed this part of the landscape. Ahead, I saw a tunnel. It looked out of place, rusted, old, a relic from a time before the city's growth. The entrance was wide enough for cars, but it was empty now, no vehicles in sight. It was the first thing I'd seen in hours that hadn't been touched by the restructuring. It felt like a lifeline, like a glimpse into a world that hadn't yet been swallowed by the city's new design. I ran toward it. I had no idea where the tunnel led, but it didn't matter. It was a way out. As I reached the entrance, I glanced back at the city one last time. The skyline was warping, growing taller, more chaotic. Buildings twisted and stretched, their surfaces rippling like liquid. Entire blocks disappeared into the ground, only to be replaced by new, featureless towers. The sky above the city looked like it had been replaced by some kind of artificial grid. The city expanding, consuming everything in its path. I stepped into the tunnel. The air was cooler here, damp and musty, like no one had set foot inside for years. As I made my way into the tunnel, the sound of the city began to fade. The clanking, the grinding, the shifting. It all grew distant, muffled by the walls around me. For the first time in days, I felt like I was getting away from it. But as I walked, I noticed something strange. The tunnel was dark, but not completely. Every few feet, there were lights, small, flashing bulbs that cast a glow on the walls. They weren't part of the original design. The tunnel had been retrofitted with something new. I kept moving, but the further I went, the more the lights began to change. The bulbs became brighter, more regular. And then, the walls of the tunnel weren't rusted metal anymore. They were smooth, polished, reflecting the light like mirrors. I slowed to a stop, dread creeping up my spine. I turned to look behind me and my heart sank. The entrance was gone. The tunnel had closed itself off, replaced by more of the city's featureless reflective surfaces. I was still inside it. The city had reached me even here. But the city hadn't absorbed me yet. It hadn't finished rewriting this part of reality. There was still time, still a chance to keep moving forward, to find something, anything, that wasn't under its control yet. I walked faster, then broke into a run, the lights overhead flashing as the tunnel stretched out in front of me, longer than it had any right to be. I didn't know where it led, but I had to believe it was taking me somewhere that wasn't part of the city's grasp. When I finally emerged from the tunnel, the first thing I noticed was the silence. No clanking, no shifting buildings, just silence. I stepped out into what looked like a barren field, with nothing but empty land stretching out in front of me. I looked back, expecting the city to be behind me, but there was nothing, just the tunnel entrance standing alone in the middle of nowhere. Had I escaped? I turned back to the open landscape, taking a few tentative steps forward. The ground felt solid beneath my feet, real. The sky above was clear, no sign of the artificial grid I'd seen over the city. But something still felt... off. As I walked, I noticed changes in the landscape. The ground shifted beneath my feet, not in an obvious way, but enough to make me stumble. The sky above me seemed to bend slightly, like the horizon was curving where it shouldn't. The city hadn't let me go. I stopped, staring out at the empty field, and for the first time, I understood the truth. The restructuring wasn't confined to the city. It was spreading, rewriting the world itself, altering reality in ways I couldn't even begin to comprehend. I was free for now, but I knew it wouldn't last. The city was still out there, growing, expanding, rewriting everything in its path. And sooner or later, it would reach me again. I kept walking, the ground shifting slightly beneath my feet, the horizon warping in the distance. There was no escaping it. The restructuring had already begun. Everywhere. Everywhere.